So good morning, everybody. Welcome to sunny, sunny Dingle. This is the Sadie Sparks panel, and uh, welcome to this session. We're going to be talking to the impressive all-female team who are bringing to life Disney's new show, which is a co-production between Brown Bag Films, Disney, and Cyber Group in France. It's called Sadie Sparks, which is a new animated sitcom for six to 11-year-olds for Disney, Europe, Middle East, and Africa channels. So I'm going to quickly introduce you to our esteemed panel here, starting with Brona O'Hanlon, director and series creator of Sadie Sparks. So just briefly on Brona, as a recent animation and multimedia graduate, Brona landed a job at Brown Bag Films very soon after she graduated as a painter, moving on to commercials director and art director for brands such as Coca-Cola and Vodafone. Brona then went on to author the popular animated series Teenology for RTE, and her role in designing, art directing, and episode directing Di Disney Junior's award-winning shows Doc McSuffins and Henry Hugglemonster paved the way to her first original series, Sadie Sparks, for Disney Channel. Her previous incarnations include Painter, Chambermaid, and Scan Monkey. <laughs> if you want to know more about the latter, you'll have to ask her offline. <laughs> Lucy Pryke at the end here creative executive in Disney's animation team for Europe, Middle East, and Africa region. Currently just under a year into her role at Disney, Lucy spent many years at the heart of CBBC's acquisitions and development team, having previously cut her teeth on the kids' business, working for Discovery Kids. Lucy's worked on shows such as Shaun the Sheep, Zig and Zag, Scream, Sheep, Scream Street, Bodice Snacks and Gumballs, Dennis the Menace and Nasher, and many, many, many more. Lucy's previous incarnations include trainee camera operator and knitting design consultant. <laughs> Beth, um, Beth Parker, sitting next to Lucy, is head of production for animation at Disney Channel's Europe, Middle East, and Africa team. Beth landed her first job in TV working for the media program in Europe, which then led to her running an animation studio in London and heading up production for a distribution company. A few years of freelancing later, Beth landed her current role working in animation production for Disney. Previous incarnations include musician, very accomplished musician by the way, potential criminologist, and youth charity worker. Rebecca Hobbs is uh, the head writer and story editor for Sadie Sparks. So after a 10 year career down under as an actress, Rebecca moved to the UK and gave in to her love for writing. After creating her first kids show, Pet Detective, which some of you may know, Rebecca found herself immersed in the world of kids TV, working in development at Fremantle and Disney before taking a career break to do an MA in screenwriting. Rebecca's worked on too many shows to mention and is now a full-time freelance writer. Rebecca's previous incarnations include lawyer, she won two cases, but she lost 12. <laughs> and then she moved on to acting. I don't know if they're linked, but you know. <laughs> So, um, and Jenny, I'm so sorry, I forgot about Jenny. <laughs> Jenny, my colleague, um, and our Director of Devel Development at Brown Bag Films, has had an impressive career spanning 20 years and working in commissioning, programming, and development of both live action and animation at places like NBC Universal, RTE, and now Brown Bag Films. Jenny's developed tentpole shows such as Henry Hoggle Monster, Bing, and many, many more. Jenny's previous incarnations include historian, reluctant philosopher, and roadie. And I'm not allowed to say who she was a roadie for, but I'm really tempted. But I'm not going to. So let's find out how our panelists, um, first of all, actually, we're going to hear from the show's creator, um, Brona O'Hanlon. We're going to hear a little bit about Sadie Sparks, and then we can take a sneak peek at the show. Well, I'll, I tend to waffle, so I'll try and keep it short and sweet. <laughs> so uh, Sadie Sparks is about a 14-year-old uh, female wizard uh, who has just come into her powers. And like all newbie trainee wizards, she's been assigned a mentor, and the mentor in her case is this extremely old, grumpy, wise-ass, jaded rabbit. <laughs> so um, it's really, um, and he's to help her with her training and to become the wizard she's meant to be. Um, at the moment, she's uh, quite a, a flighty uh, teenage girl who's trying to juggle her uh, wizarding responsibilities with her um, with her high school life and trying to not make a show of herself, really, like all of us. <laughs> Um, so really it's, it's kind of a zany odd couple show and it's at the heart of it and it's how these two really gel off each other and she starts um, getting through his hard brush shell you know, to show the, the real kind of um, bonds that they both have. Um, so we're going to show you um, a 
clip from um, the teaser that we did. And now this is a, um, quite old, but we've edited in some of the um, production artwork and some of the work in progress models in it. So you can sort of see where we're uh, going with it. But uh, before I show that to you, I should probably just explain one of the uh, quirky things that I actually love about the show. And it's, it's gonna be a mix of 2D and 3D. So there's two worlds in the show. There's uh, the 2D um, magical world and then there's the 3D world. So the real world is 3D, but when you jump through Gilbert's top hat, the 3D characters will actually physically turn into 2D characters for um, the 2D section of the world. So you get this lovely contrast and interplay between the two. So. The spell you get on me, it's like magic. Come and feel it like a fall in love. Come and feel it like a never get back about the roles that everybody plays on Sadie Sparks. Um, I'm going to start with Brona. How did you come to have the idea for Sadie Sparks? What's your day-to-day -day experience like as a creator of the series? Um, oh, God. Two, two big questions. Um, I guess when sometimes when you're coming up with ideas for shows, it usually starts with just one small stupid question that you ask yourself, like, wouldn't it be funny if or what if? And I don't know why it came into my head, but one time I was asking myself, why rabbits in top hats for magicians? Like, who was the first magician who thought, this is going to be a thing? And I just thought from that, it just started rolling in my head. Um, it would be funny if um, that rabbits played an integral part in being a magician and that they got the bum end of the deal because, like, uh, no one knows that, like, without them, magic wouldn't happen, that they're, like, this mentor. <laughs> and how it would be funny if there was this one rabbit who was, like, severely bitter. Like, he's been, he's been working with Merlin, all the greats, Rasputin, some of them didn't go too well. And he's had a slump in his career. And just after that, it was like, so Gilbert came first in my head. And then he just thought, what would be the best contrast as an odd couple character to put with him? And I thought he's so jaded and on such a career low at the moment. That would be just great to have like a young teenage female that he's never worked with before, either teenage or female. And just she's optimistic, enthusiastic, and just how she nearly redeems him and brings him back to the land of the living, really. Enjoy. And it sort of went from there. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy. And, oh, sorry, you asked, I yeah, can't and, remember and, that. And, just, um, and what's the experience like as creator of the series? I mean, that's a very wide open question. Oh, so yeah. It's... Like. It's awesome, like, it's brilliant, but like, I, like I've worked in Brand Bag for 15 years and I think the one thing, I've worked on a lot of pitches for other shows that aren't mine, and I think the one thing you learn is um, just really enjoy the experience because it will be long, yeah. you know, and then just expect nothing at the end of it, you know, like it's good, it's great experience to do it. There's a very high possibility it'll fall flat on its face for no reason that you can even explain. And just, just enjoy it and like at the end of it, if you're lucky, I always thought, it's great I'll have a teaser trailer. <laughs> and then after that, it, when it got picked up, it's like, oh great, like it might actually get made, so. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. 
So, Jenny, um, this idea was brought to you by Brona. Um, tell us what happened when she first brought it to you, and then how you took it from initial concept through to where it is now. Like, what does it really take to develop a show from scratch? <laughs> Years. <laughs> um, Brona first brought it to us actually in 2009, so that's how long you know ago it was. And it was it was a different show at the time, um, but that central concept was there, which we really loved. But it was a 2D show, um, and it just it wasn't a fit for us at Brown Bag right then. Um, so it was parked for four years, really, until the end of 2013, uh, when, I, you know, Verona can tell the story, <laughs> but we... I was a cheeky. Yeah. Uh, I was a bit cheeky. Uh, we, we had a, a, um, someone came in from a toy manufacturer and they wanted um, two certain types of show and they were wondering if we had anything on our plates or, or slate. They wanted an adventure show, show for boys and they wanted a... <laughs> she, she started, I can't remember all the adjectives she used, but every single one was literally this show. <laughs> she was saying magical show, female hero, um, aimed at, aspirational, aimed at girls. White body rabbit. Yeah, <laughs> and, and my boss was in the room and I was going, would it be really cheeky to bring up this show that's been sort of dead for four years? So I, I pretended to go to the loo and I went to my computer, reread the pitch, came back in and go, oh, well, you know, by the way, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, honestly, I, I was actually worried because I thought my boss was going to look at me and go, you, oh, <laughs> no, 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 the other one. <laughs> and just go, oh, you're so, like, how, how could you just, you know, throw this on me kind of thing. This was all in my head and I just had to sort of park that and just plow ahead and, yeah. and, and he, he didn't even remember it so yeah. I was like <laughs> he was like wow that's a great idea <laughs> and meanwhile I was thinking you know always love this show this is perfect bring it back so we we right away I mean we jumped straight into it like really fast and the first thing because brown bag at that time were only producing CG um, animation the first thing and Brona had had so much more experience by then she had designed Doc McStuffins and was you know working um, you know, as art director on these shows and had so much more experience that she'd redesigned them, the characters as CG and it just brought it to a whole other level, especially that the transition between this, the CG world and the 2D world, which just gave it an extra edge. So yeah. we got very excited about it very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, you know, really, you know, Brona and I had worked very closely together for years, which made it a lot easier, mm -hmm. but because the, pro the process then is really just sitting there and brainstorming for hours and hours on end and me flinging you know thousands of questions of Rona you know what what's her mother like what's her relationship with her brother you know is she flighty does she get nervous I get a random speaks? email at like you know 12 o'clock at night going does she have a wand yeah. and then you just have yeah. to like write an answer wand versus potion, you know yeah. pros and cons <laughs> so a lot of this um kind of just you know, there's no wrong or right answer. It's just whatever's in Brona's head to try and pull it out <laughs> um, to make me understand it. Because if I don't understand it, I can't kind of hone the development of it. And then you, you try to get it down on paper um, and uh, hone that, that sort of first pitch um, and get the artwork ready. And then it's really that scary thing of going out to, to broadcasters and, you know, as a very kind of initial first pitch going, what do you think? And you're, you're laying your babies out there, you know. But, um, that's and as you're just is. about to do the pitch, they say, by the way, we're not doing anything with magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or rabbit. <laughs> ah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Rebecca, as head writer, can you talk us through the myriad touch points which tie in with the writing process and how that works on Sadie Sparks? Because it's not just about writing, is it? It's not just about... Oh. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had to ask who actually told me this because I've got it second, second, third hand. So, wonderful showrunner called um, Robert Vargas, when I first started this, this is my first head writing gig, so it's like, <clears throat> um, and I said, well, well, can, you give me some, can you give me some tips? And he said, yes. Alexi Wheeler from Nickelodeon said, the first time, the, being a showrunner is like running off a cliff and then trying to learn how to build a plane on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what it's like. <laughs> because every show is different, the makeup of every show is different. In our case, we have, we have to have 40 of the 52 scripts written by French qualifying writers, which means a whole lot of translation back and forth. It means me trying to turn franglais into English. Um, mm -hmm. It means, you know, whole different cultural things like we believe that, that you say the opposite of what you mean. And often the French go, but why would you do that? That's just a waste of your time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, so lots and lots of different things. But in the process, you, you, the writing process goes, find the writers, um, get them to pitch stories, get them to a premise, strong enough premise stage to send to Disney, get it validated to move to outline, 
to move to first draft, second draft, then we go to a polish, and every single stage involves, we've got three partners in our co-production um, giving their notes and feedback on it and collating all of that into one coherent thing for the writer, because you cannot give contradictory notes to writers. It's just the worst thing you could possibly do. And then, after you've got a script that, you've, that you like, then you go to cast actors to voice record it, so that hopefully, generally, it's better to have the records before the storyboards, because it just gives them a much better sense of the pace and the rhythm of the whole thing. And then, you know, once you get to animatic, again, I'm, I'm looking mostly at story points and pace, and if I feel like a piece of comedy has sort of twisted or whatever. Brona and I have discovered, though, over like the last couple of years of working together, that we, we have sort of the same mind. <laughs> so we've, we've managed to, to spot, sl split apart a, couple, a lot of things now because I know that she'll say the same thing that I would and vice versa, so it's like easy. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So, um, Lucy, I'm just going to go to you quickly. Um, as the editorial lead for Disney, how many stages of production are you involved with? Um, so we're involved right from beginning to the, to the end. So um, early, we, we take a, a sort of light touch role in, in development. And then once we go into production, we'll be involved in writing right through the scripting process. Um, casting, we'll be at the voice records. Um, we'll, we'll look at the animatic, we'll look at the animation, and then we'll give notes on sound mix. So right from the beginning to the end. Um, there are six of us in the animation team at Disney EMEA region, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, we've probably got 10, 10 shows, 10 or 11 shows in production, wow. and 11, thanks Beth, <laughs> um, and many more in development, and uh, yes, so we'll be... It's a very detailed yeah. process, there's a lot, lot of different areas to look after really, aren't there, at the same time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot going on. Thank you. And Beth, um, as, head of, as head of production for Disney on the Disney side, can you walk us through your level of involvement in Sadie Sparks? And also just tell us what it was that attracted Disney to this show in the first place. Wow. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start with the, the dull bit first, which is um, my role. <laughs> um, I work across all the animated series that are in production and development, so my kind of input is sort of in proportion to how many shows we have on, which is, yeah, we've got about 11 in production, and probably about that again, plus some more in, in development. Um, I kind of work right from the very beginning, so the point that we decide we want to pick up a show, I will work with um, both finance and legal and programming teams to make sure that we've actually got the space in our broadcast plans to do it, and also the money to do it. And then I'm really there to make sure that the mechanical, everything that's mechanical is in place to enable that sort of magical storytelling to take place. So right from the beginning, I'll, work, I'll make sure that legal have got everything that they need to be able to make the deals. Um, I'll make sure that the financing's in place. I'll work with the external producers, so in this case, Brownbag and Cyber Group, to make sure that their budgets and that their schedules are, as far as we're concerned, realistic, so that we can get the quality of product that we want. Um, and also to make sure that they've um, made an allowance for the amount of creative input that we have in their production schedules as well. Because that's always sort of quite, quite underestimated a little bit. And then once we go into production, um, my team works with the creative team to make sure that everything that comes in at every single stage is reviewed, that that's done on time, that we track it, um, that all the other sort of people, it's, you know, our compliance partners, everybody in, in Disney is, is across everything. So it's a lot of juggling um, and, and trying to keep people happy. Um, as far as what, what, what we look for primarily is really good strong characters. And, and that's exactly what attracted us to this in the first place. Also, no, we, we've had some success recently with uh, female leads in animation um, on Disney Channel in particular, which is more kind of, has traditionally been more live action. We've had good success with Miraculous uh, uh, Ladybug and Cat Noir. Um, and so the strong female lead, as well as the strong female crew, really brought us, really, really brought our attention to the show and made us want to work with, with these guys. Great, thank you. So, um, you know, 
I think it's very interesting for, for anybody, but particularly for this panel of women, to, to figure out how it was that they ended up in the dark arts of animation production. <laughs> One does have to sometimes ask oneself the question, why do any of us work in animation? It's crazy, mad business. It's like mortgaging five houses and on a wing and a prayer and hoping that maybe you'll recoup that cost and make some money sometime. I mean, it's just a crazy, ridiculous business to be in, in some ways, but also amazing, fantastic. So I want to talk um, to our panelists about what it was that brought them, um, what their path to this career was. So I think that's quite an interesting, interesting um, journey to follow. So Rebecca, I'm going to start Whoa. with you. <laughs> so, um, and I'm quoting you here, you see ideas as gifts, which I think is a lovely, lovely thought. Um, but I wanted to know, how has your career taken you from being a trained lawyer to a professional actress to writing for television? Ooh. <laughs> um, the law was really just to get something to fall back on because I wanted to be an actress and I grew up in an acting writing family. And, uh, Were you in Neighbours? <laughs> no, I was not in Neighbours. Um, <laughs> I was in Shortland Street, the whole other country. Um, but. Uh, so the law was to get something to fall back on, and then you know, you you've done your law degree and you're massively in debt, and then everyone said, oh well, you have to actually work for a couple of years, otherwise you can never actually fall back on it. So I was like, oh okay, and uh, so I did that, and in the first year, I think I was too scared to audition for drama school, but also I wasn't a good enough lawyer. I knew I wasn't, and then in the second year, I was like, yeah, it's time, and also I knew that my salary was about to jump up. And I thought, if I stay, then the need to hang on to the security will get too strong, and I won't have the bravery to make the leap. So I just like went, Whoa! and um, went to drama school. While I was at drama school, I had an amazing improv teacher who, who, point, who said to me, there's something you always do in the improv narrative classes. You're always the one that turns the story and takes it in a di different direction. And I was like, oh, am I? And she said, you should think about writing. Never did anything about it. Um, and then sort of like a few years later, I snapped my Achilles. And, um, and I was an unemployed actress at the time and suddenly became an unemployable actress. And a friend of mine, um, a producer, was just starting to write a new TV drama about lawyers. And I was like, ah, I used to be a lawyer. I like the idea of writing and I can't act right now. What do you think? And he was just he was just one of those amazing people that just turned up and he goes, sure, give me an idea, write it up, I'll have a read of it. And he did say, and I remember this to this day, he was like, um, take your time, we've got plenty of time. And as it turned out, they were devising their writing team within the next sort of few days. Oh, yeah. And there was one slot left kind of thing. But I stayed up for 24 hours and wrote up an idea, felt like, oh, like you know, this is amazing, <laughs> best thing in the world, so I don't need any, you know, coffee or anything. And I sent it in the next day, and amazingly, they said, yeah, we'll give you a chance. So, yeah, I mean, I think, for me, it was like accidents, you know, Snap and Achilles, but also incredible luck, incredible luck all the way along the way. And I've had that, you know, here as well um, with Gilbert and Sadie, so um, I had, I'd left Disney, and I'd gone off and done my career break and, and screenwriting course, and then I was basically wandering around the house in my pajamas going, oh, I'll just never be able to do this, this is hopeless. And uh, my old boss from Disney said, now, I want you, I'm sending you a list of people. You write to them, and you tell them you're a, you're a very good creative executive, and you're a scriptwriter, so just, you know, write to them all. One of them was Jenny, and she wrote back and said, well, we have this Gilbert and, and Ellie at the time um, show. Would you like to try, oh, what did I write? I wrote a dialogue for your... Um, we were doing a teaser. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. And I just did a punch up on the dialogue yeah. for that for free. And then Jenny was like, no, we will pay you. And also, would you like to write a script? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then it, it was like another year went past. And then I was doing some consultation work for Disney. And they sent me a list of potential head writers for Gilbert and Sadie. And my husband was like, I was storming around the living room going, I could do that. I love this show. Me and Rona work really well together. It should be me. And he went, well, ask for it. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> so I wrote a 10 point bullet point plan about why I should have the job <laughs> and sent it off. And As if I weeks, needed to be convinced. <laughs> and then, like, I just two thought weeks you were like, like, wire memo. Yeah, I thought she was unavailable the whole time. We used to sit there going, if only we could get Rebecca. 
Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. That's Very fantastic. Luck. Thank you. That's such a good story. <laughs> Um, so, and Brona, when you studied animation, um, was this your ultimate goal? I mean, there must have been a lot of hard work in the 15 years between when you started and yeah. now. Oh no, like I always like wanted to get into animation and even in college I, I leaned more towards the design part and then, uh, and you know, like the look and feel than anything else. But um, a friend of mine, uh, Sinead Lawless, was working in Brand Bag at the time and they just won the Oscar for... Um, or not, sorry, sorry, they were Oscar nominated, nominated for <laughs> Give Up Your Old Sins. Not yet. Yeah. Um, and um, she went off to England and um, I was, I, I didn't, like I, I couldn't pluck up the courage to ask her to, you know, like put a good word in for me. Um, but I thought once she goes, I know there's a position, I don't want to put her in that position, you know, and I'll go and, and I'll apply there. And without me knowing it, um, she orchestrated me being in the company. She said she left her jacket behind. So I was downstairs <laughs> reading a paper and Brian Gilmore came downstairs and go, oh, so you want an interview for the job? I absolutely haven't got a rash is what he was talking about. And um, it was, I mean, there was only four people at the time and they needed basically a, like a dog's body formerly known as uh, Scan Monkey, like Dance Monkey Dance, to literally <laughs> scan in all the images on the computer. And all you, you really need is an in, and then try and make yourself, worm your way in, make yourself indispensable. But like, honestly, to this day, they haven't even seen my portfolio. <laughs> 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 Is that true? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I think it's just, you know, like, get in there and then just, you know, hold on with your... And do, do everything. Oh, do yeah, everything. like I, Jesus, I was like doing, breaking down lip sync. I mean, scanning in images is one of the most boring jobs. Yet, slightly relaxing as well. You're just there all day. <laughs> and it's so only nice. And then, um, you know, there's always, I mean, the longer you spend there, there's always going to be a time when they need someone to do something else, especially when you're, you work your way up in a boutique company. Yeah. I mean, like from five people to like, is it two? 30 to 230, 60? I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, in and, Dublin. Yeah. And the, the closer or the, when you start and work your way in like that, if start small, like you, you start to really have a voice, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you're not used to really um, tooting your own horn, which I wasn't, it, it's good to have, you know, a little bit more of that in where you feel like you can actually go to people and go, mm -hmm. yeah, look at this. Show you this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. brilliant. So now Beth. Um, having dr dreamed of earning a living as a musician, um, how was it that you ended up living all over Europe and then working in animation production at Disney? Um, yeah, I wanted to be I wanted to be a jazz pianist. <laughs> and look at the size of my hands; they're not very big. Um, well, connection, you are a jazz pianist. By the way. I'm not, yeah, and I wanted to, you know, and I worked all this sort of angst-ridden teenage years. I wanted to be a sort of jazzy pianist singer, songwriter. Um, my parents are both artists and consequently very poor. Um, my dad was like, my dad was just kind of, go and do something sensible. You can, you know, you carry on with your piano lessons, but go and do something sensible because you are actually quite bright. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, kind of, I left school, didn't really know what to do, so I, I travelled for a little bit and, and worked in France and then came back and thought, yeah, yeah that wasn't bad. Um, I'll go and do a language and business degree. So that's what I did. I studied um, economics and politics in French and German. Um, and I thought, and at the time, because this is quite going a couple of decades back, Europe was still a nice, good name in Britain. So it was <laughs> sort of a, it was a good degree to have. Um, everyone was very enthusiastic about the European Union, oh, if only. <laughs> um, so, so that's what I did, and it took me to France, and it took me to Germany, and I went to Munich, and I quite liked living in Munich. Um, I'd gotten into a cut, my music career had kind of started flourishing again. I'd got into some very dodgy kind of electronic keyboard bands where we all just kind of stood around going, <laughs> um, I'm going plank, 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 um, and, and trying to be inspired by Depeche Mode. Um, Depeche Mode. They're great. <laughs> Um, and that, that wasn't earning me an awful lot of money, so I was, uh, you know, I was doing some odd jobs as you do when you leave college. Um, but I found this job um, at, at the job centre, as it was then, because the internet was still a new thing. Um, and it, there was a guy who just won a contract from the European Union um, to run what is now Creative Europe, um, but it was the Media 2 distribution at the time. And um, they were looking for multilinguists who had a bit of database knowledge. So I was quite handy in that I could speak the language of Europe, which was French at the time, and German and English. 
um, and I winged my way into the job on the sort of databases. Um, and through that, I managed to make contact with an awful lot of people who were making television and film in, in Europe. So when I decided that actually I wanted to come back to go back to London, I just picked up the phone to an awful lot of people and did a lot of lunches and um, put myself about a bit in the sort of best term possible. Um, and it took it did take a while actually to get to get a job. So I'd say like Lucy, I did lots of uh, you know I worked in a supermarket. Um, um, I made mirrors for a while. Um, <laughs> and ran out of savings. And then eventually what happened was there was a German company that I knew who were based in Munich um, who were buying a studio in London and they asked me whether I wanted, wanted their job as head of production. Um, I was like, yeah. <laughs> Um, didn't know anything about animation other than the flick books my sister had made me as a, as a child. Um, but I knew a little bit about budgets and scheduling and also contracts because I'd worked for the media programme and I'd gone through everybody's applications and, um, and so knew what a licence deal and a co-production deal looked like, kind of knew what a budget and schedule looked like. Um, and I thought I'll just wing it for animation, which is really what I did. Um, so I was worked, this was, this was at Imagination. so I was a head of production at Imagination for quite some time. Um, and then when the MD left, I took over running the studio. Um, I was also working for the distribution company at the time, TV Lumland. Um, while I was working on, I think it was Cramp Twins, the second season of Cramp Twins, which um, was, was a massive show for Imagination and TV Lumland at the time. But um, I got talking to somebody, at, I think it was, the director used to throw these crazy parties, and I was talking to someone about, um, about my, my teenage years, my, my childhood, and it turned out we, we knew a couple of the same people. And it turned out that one of these kids that we'd grown up with um, had ended up in prison and had, um, um, had actually OD'd when we were, when oh. we were 24. And through that, I decided I wanted to do some voluntary work. So I started volunteering for a young offenders charity, and I really enjoyed it. It got a lot out of it. So I then went back, and whilst we were doing another show, French Canadian so co-production, I also decided to do a master's in criminology, um, which just cause. <laughs> and when I, that happened, I actually graduated at the time that we wrapped on um, on the show, and TV Luland went down the toilet. Um, so I left and I did three years working for a youth charity, working with, with kids who um, hadn't seen the best side of life um, sort of set up their own businesses. Um, after that, I went, because it, it was a project, I was only on it for a sort of contract, contracted amount of time. Um, I then did sort of quite a lot of freelancing with both charities, but then also people from the animation industry. I'd kept going to Annecy whilst I was out of the industry. Right. So I kept in touch with people. I'd kept going to Annecy just because I like Annecy. Mm -hmm. um, um, and Is I'd that kept in you touch. got the gig at Disney? Sort of, just yeah. yeah. In fact, it was, it was um, Ken Anderson at Red Kite yeah. who gave me a call and said, do you fancy coming and working for me for a couple of days? So I was like, oh, yeah, all right, then, you know, sort of, I can do that. And, and then charity work at the same time. And whilst I was there, somebody who was there had actually gone and interviewed for the job that I've got now, but had said, it wasn't for me, you should apply. Oh. Um, and I thought, well, everyone who's worked in animation at some point wants to work for Disney. Um, so I well, yeah, well, applied and um, sort of half-heartedly went along to the interview thinking, there's no way they're going to want me because I keep chopping and changing my career. Um, but they did. So yeah, that was yeah. uh, three years ago. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Oh. Are you God, saying we've got five minutes? minutes? I make it eight. <laughs> I make it eight, I like it. Okay, so um, I'm going to try and speed things up a little bit. Um, Lucy, at what point in your career did you realise that this was the right fit for you? And um, what do you think makes a good creative exec? <coughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got a cold. That can happen more often. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Sounds a fact, so. Rona doesn't like me. <laughs> Um, right, so I'll try, and, I'll try and keep it quite quick. But somewhere in the middle is the answer to um, the second part about wanting to work in animation. So um, I was sure I wanted to be a camera operator. I did a vocational course, which pretty much, end, pretty much ended with the job. 
Um, but at the same time, I found out I was pregnant with my son. Um, so I thought, no problem, I'll have him pop on my back, go to work. No. Um, <laughs> it was at a time when they were encouraging more, female in, more females in technical roles. Um, but the reality was, when you had a child, the doors weren't as open. So, but I tried and tried. I applied for so many jobs. I tried for every, every camera, every camera role, every every visual role, um, and I didn't get anywhere. And after after eight years, I, I was successful. But it took a long time. So during that time, I thought, well, what have I got experience of that I could also do? And that was I knew how to knit. Um, I ended up working for a a knitting company called Rowan, um, and was a design consultant helping people, teaching people how to knit and helping with their patterns. Um, I'd also worked in a library uh, while I was studying, and I got myself a job as a part-time library system. And, and that's what I thought I was going to end up doing forever. But I still tried. If a job came up, I, I gave it a go anyway. Mm -hmm. Due to um, an, a, a, a wonderful man who interviewed me for a, a role at Discovery and thought, that I was the right fit, even though I hadn't been working in the creative industry for so long. Um, I finally got a step in. Um, started off in, uh, as a presentation scheduler, and then moved over to programming, and then worked on uh, acquisitions and a bit of commissioning, and then they launched a channel called the Disco Discovery Kids. Um, and I was working with all these very serious people who wanted to make documentaries about serious things like the American Civil War, and, um, and they said, we're going to launch a kids' channel. And I was like, I'd, I'd like to do that. Please can I do that? Because I really enjoy... Um, uh, I enjoyed watching television with my son. I used to love all the classic Supo animation. Um, and due to being passionate and enthusiastic and not serious as the rest of them... Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I was given a lot more responsibility and ended up running Discovery Kids in the UK and did that for eight years. And some of what we... And that was my first sort of... Uh, we, some of the programmes we commissioned, make, making factual entertainment fun involved some animation, so we did some with um, Cosgrove Hall. And uh, so that was my first experience, and I thought, this is brilliant, this is what I want to do forever. Anyway, Discovery Kids didn't last forever. So <laughs> I, um, I left Discovery... I left Discovery um, and then I was like, um, I was offered a couple of jobs. One of them would have been a, a long-term job sort of in programming, and another one was at the BBC in development coming up with ideas. And I thought, well, I've worked with all these creative people for a long time. Can I do that myself? And so I did that for three months. It was short. It was short term. And it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, but it was really good to put myself in that position because as an exec, you're working with these talented people and you, you question yourself, can I do it myself? And so I could, but I found it really hard. <laughs> so I it is immense really hard. respect. <laughs> it is really hard. I have immense respect for all of you. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that, that was short term. Um, and then I probably got to my career low point where I still needed to earn money, but there wasn't the right job there at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up working for a leading supermarket chain, programming their uh, grocery aisles. So <laughs> we would have... <laughs> my job was to work out, um, you know, what went on where. If there was a, an offer on wine and spirits or bananas mm -hmm. were 34 pence, my job was to put all that together and make sure the customers knew about it. Um, and I'd sometimes see people I used to work with because it was in the same area and, and kind of dark because I didn't really want to tell them what I was doing. But that didn't, la that didn't last forever. And I went on to work... Uh, for a channel called Teachers TV in acquisitions, and then CBBC. And thank you to some brilliant people like Sarah Muller and Cheryl Taylor, who encouraged me, um, uh, put me in put me in a position where I could really develop the skills I wanted to develop. I ended up working on shows like Shaun the Sheep, um, Zig and Zag, and the other shows that Alex mentioned. What makes a good creative exec? Well, I, I think I don't know if we're going to have that much. <laughs> <laughs> Only because we've got two minutes left, right? Okay. And I haven't asked Jenny yet. Oh, that's okay. okay. Yes, Jenny, go on. I'm so <laughs> sorry. To know what I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, Jenny. What, Mike? Oh, I will very, very be very brief. Yes. Uh, I worked as a general dog's body in live action film and TV, always for adult audiences uh, for a really long time, and all, you know, did everything. Um, 
because you know it was a small indie company. But I was very presumptuous. I used to there was a great head of development there, and I used to literally just photocopy the scripts, and I'd be like, "You see here, maybe you should," you know, which looking back was probably obnoxious. But she <laughs> she just took me under her wing and really, really helped me and mentored me. You know, I always look back on she really set me in a direction. Um, but I didn't. I, I started working at Universal Pictures, and I worked in a, a um, kind of a strange department in that it did music videos and um, you know fitness videos, kids stuff, sort of a mix of anything that didn't really have a home within Universal Studios. It wasn't a big feature film or, or long format TV. And um, that's really when I first started working with animation. Um, and I was re immediately drawn to it. And I honestly think what drew me to it is the fact that I can't draw. I am absolutely mm. useless. And still, you know, after all these years, I'm just amazed and fascinated and ex excited by the kind of stuff, you know, when, when Brona brings me a design, how did you do that, you know? <laughs> so it just, the immediacy of animation, having worked in across developing and, and programming, the fact that, you know, for, for live action film, for a long time, you're just working on script, 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 and you're kind of getting your team together. But with animation, you're working on script and story, and you're seeing the characters come alive visually on the page. Um, it just really was so much more immersive for me in development. Um, and I moved back to Ireland. I had always worked in London. I moved back to Ireland and started working in RT Young Peoples. And the, my very first day, uh, Dara and Nikki Phelan from Brownback came in to pitch a, his first short form show. And we commissioned that. I started working with Brownback from RTE and then jumped ship. And, uh, <laughs> Did they steal you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. How are you going to and, and that's where I've been, you know, so. But I think for me, a lot about being a development director is just about facilitating people's ideas and making sure that their creative vision is, is, is looked after mm -hmm. and is consistent and, and is challenged as well, you know. So why are you so tied to this idea? You know, what is it about it? Don't you think maybe you should, you know? And sometimes the answer is, no, I'm right. And, you know, you kind of want to challenge that a little bit. So that's, that's where I've come. Great, mm. thank you very much. So um, we're just about to wrap things up, but before we do so, I'm just going to throw out a few. I'd like you all to give some tips to our audience, do's and don'ts. <laughs> and I'm just going to pick you randomly and just give me some do's or don'ts. Lucy, give me a do. Um, do be passionate and um, excited about what you do. It will give you, it will put you in better stead in your career than a five-year de development plan. Beth, give me a don't. Don't be afraid to diversify. Um, the path you start out on might not be the one you end up on. Rebecca, give me a do. You can see the pattern. I see. I <laughs> do. Okay, so if you're pitching, do be in love with your story, not where it might be able to take you. So if you're looking at the person you're pitching to going, how are they going to advance my career? The story's going to fall flat. If you're looking at them going, I really want to tell you this amazing story that I've got in my head and I just got to get it out, they will love it, I think. Jenny, give me a don't. Don't send your uh, development pitch to a company who very clearly say on their website, we are not accepting development <laughs> pitches. It will just annoy them. Just check with them. Check in you know, and, and check back after a few months. But it really, go, it, well, you know, most production companies will have a kind of a clear submissions policy. And if you really want to get your idea to that person or that company, just look and see what they want, what they need, and when they need it, and, and target it that way. Give me a do, Brona. Oh, damn, I have the do ready. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, give me a do. Oh, I'll give you a do. Uh, do be your own worst critic, because um, if you just can self edit yourself, you know, like give yourself some breathing room, go back to it, strip it back, you know, like um, don't be precious, you know, um, and it gets to a stage then when you're working with other people. Um, and they say something like, um, give you a note, you're going, damn, I, I, was, I was actually thinking that myself, you know, and yeah, then you get yeah. used to how they think, and you know, like, and sometimes by the time it gets there, you've preemptive a lot of what's going to be said about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Give me a don't, Lucy. No. Or do. Don't, you know, when you're... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know you were going to go around. Give me a, give me a do. Give me don't a do. pick your nose when you're pitching ideas. <laughs> do anything. Oh, that sounds like hard-worn <laughs> advice. Beth, give me a... Give me a 
whatever you want, don't. Uh, or do. I, I would say be realistic with your expectations. Um, you know, but being uh, directing a series is very different to directing a graduation film. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, give me something. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you've got an idea that you're really thrilled about, just choose a few really trusted people. Keep that number small to tell it to, because if you tell it to too many people, you're really just looking for people to react, and you'll just get baffled with lots of different opinions. Jenny. Um, I think, going back to what you said about don't be afraid to diversify, I think in, in a studio or in, in your role, don't be afraid to do something that's outside the remit of your job description. So, like going back to me reading scripts and giving like tentative script notes, uh, when I really was just receptionist and office manager. Um, you know, if you do it in a polite and respectful way, people will note your interest. So it's worth putting yourself out there a little bit. Okay. Yeah. And then... Well, I have a don't now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't overthink it. I mean, if, if I'd overthought it too much, I wouldn't have pitched the idea the second time. Um, you can talk yourself out of anything. You just have to, like when you go for a job and you're like going, I'm 70% sure. I mean, if you're a very sensible person, you go like, I'm 70% sure I can do this job. You know, and, but you're never going to be 100% sure unless you've job, done the job before and you're never going to get the job before unless you actually just fake it till you make it. So that's true. It, that's it. <laughs> so I think we're going to wrap things up there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have one do as well at the end because this is, an, this is an old female panel. It's a pretty rare thing, actually. It's got to be said. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so, so just to, to, to the women out there, I think it's worth knowing that there is a lot of support and mentoring and networking opportunities through um, women in animation in Ireland. You should just subscribe. There are events and, you know, everyone, we're all here to support you and to help you and to, 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 to you know, um, introduce you to people and so on. So, so, so use that resource. In the UK, it's called um, Animated Women UK. And actually, there are chapters in France and other places as well. So do use that resource. Um, especially, you know, we really want to bring up women in, 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 in VFX and in, in the more technical roles and also animators. There, is, there, is, there aren't enough women who are doing those roles right now in the UK and in Ireland. So um, do, do sign up to that. And um, we're all going to be in the room next door if anyone wants to talk to any of the panellists. And you can find us and talk to us there, but not in the loo, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.